I really think this person was the one. Good evening. And welcome to the September 9th School Board Special Business Meeting. Uh, welcome back to school. And um, we'll get right down to business. Item one, adjustments to the agenda. Are there any adjustments to tonight's agenda that we should be aware of? Seeing none. Item two, approval of school board minutes. May I have a motion? I move that we approve uh, the school board minutes dated uh, August 26, 2014. Uh, is there a second? I second the motion. Thank you, Susanna. Is there any discussion? John, did I miss the Pledge of Allegiance? It was, it was quick. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, I missed the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, thank you. Um, but we could do that. But let's, no, that's okay. I just didn't know no. if I missed something. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Chat at all. You're, all you blacked out for a minute. Your eyes <laughs> rolled back in your head. <laughs> Um, but you seem fine. So I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> I'm sorry. We'll get. We'll get. We'll, we're going to we're circle back to the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, thanks, Kate. Um, are there? Is there any other discussion on the motion? All those in favor. Okay. All right. So. <laughs> now, would you all please stand and join me in, a, in the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I feel better. Now I feel better. Thank you, Kate. My, my apologies for that. I'm a little rusty. That's right. Um, Item three, are there comments from the public tonight on agenda items? Okay, seeing none. Item four, uh, communications. First um, from, from, I'm sorry. Are student representatives perhaps? They aren't listed. So I would suggest listed. that we include comments from our student representatives. All right, let's start with our student our representatives. We have um, Sierra Bates um, back again for another year. Thank you, Sierra, for being back this year. Um, and Natalie Vaughn is with us too. Um, and we look forward to hearing from you um, each meeting. And thanks, thanks for being here. Okay. Um, well, everyone's adjusting back into the swing of school, waking up early. <laughs> Um, seniors are starting the process of the application, and I would say that pretty much everyone's pretty, feeling pretty confident this year. It's been, um, they, I, we've seen some changes in the high school this year, especially with the hello movement that we've kind of initiated, so all the teachers are trying to make those more connections, and the advisory program's also been super successful thus far. Um, we, and then do you want to talk about the freshmen? Yeah, um, our freshmen have come in and they've started adjusting to life in the high school. Um, using the FreshLinks program, I think most of the freshmen feel pretty comfortable with their one or two other FreshLinks that they can see in the hallways. A lot of them play sports and are involved in other activities, so they're adjusting pretty well. Everyone's also getting their schedules figured out. Um, so if there are any kinks in the schedule, I think those have been worked out and everyone's adjusting nicely to their new classes. And we did have one question for the school board. We, um, nobody really has a problem with paying for parking, but we were just wondering what the justification behind it was. Are you looking for an answer tonight? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> All right, who wants to take that one? Mr. Finance Chair, would you like to take that one? Uh, usually we form a committee to answer those types of questions. <laughs> <laughs> We'll have to caucus to get okay. back to you. Uh, the parking fees predate, or the, the origin of the parking fees predates my arrival here in town, so, I, so I'll ask Principal Shedd to correct me if I'm misspeaking on this, but I believe that part of it was around at a time when the athletic fees were implemented, when the district was looking at 
avenues to bring in some funding to offset the costs of programs, that parking fees was one of the pieces that was explored as an option. Um, you know, being able to park at the high school is, is considered a privilege, and so having students pay for that privilege at a time when they were already going to be able to access public transportation seemed like a reasonable route to take in order to bring in some additional funds to the district at that time. Anything you would add, Mr. Shedd? Thank you so much. And I, I can't, I, well, I was on the board when those fees were increased. That was a, that was a number of years ago, but it was, it was in a period just during the, the financial crisis. Uh, and budgets were really tight, and it was, it was seen as a way that um, students who were, again, who were availing themselves of a, of a specific privilege could, could chip in for some of the, the cost to make some of the other programs uh, in the school district possible. So that, that's, that was the origin of the increase, and, and, and I, I, can't, I can't dodge responsibility for that. That was something that I, I supported at the time. Um, should we call I, I it carbon credit purchasing? <laughs> <laughs> Sierra, it is, uh, will be, uh, if it is included in the budget proposal, it is something you're more than welcome to um, inquire about and rally, uh, you know, the troops around. I would say I look at it as, uh, you know, there's a, uh, even though it's not popular, I'm sure, you know, high school students can take the bus and the district already provides, um, transportation and then the re reasoning is the high school parking lots you do have to pay for plowing and maintenance so um, it's an issue we look at every year but feel free to um, I don't think anybody necessarily has a problem with paying they were just wondering why we were paying and where the money was going towards and I think that helps a lot that answer thank you thank you for That's that report great question. and um, we we look forward to hearing other questions from, from the student government if those come along. Uh, and now on to item 4A, the 2014 Open Doors Studio Summer Program. And we'll be hearing from... I think Ruth Ellen Vaughn is going to start Vaughn. things off, but we have some teachers here um, as well to talk about their work this summer. first regular education program for the summer for students. Um, we named it Open Door Studios and that was taken from the school's motto, Open Minds, Open Doors. Um, our program was to support students with additional subject exposure in both literacy and math. And the goal was to create a studio experience for students so that they could engage with material in a way that wasn't just siloed, okay, now we're going to do reading, now we're going to do math, but to look at things in an inquiry-based fashion. We looked at a larger question for all of the age groups, what shapes a place and how do we tell its tale? Um, we had multi-age classrooms, grades one through three, grades four through six, and grades seven through nine. As I said before, we had an integrated curriculum and the activities included creative writing, reading, speaking, listening, moving, performing, measuring, mapping, graphing, exploring, researching, observing, recording, and coding. And students had an opportunity to build their own video games. They had an opportunity to do some surveying. They had a chance to do some robotics. It was very broad applications of a lot of the different skills. Initial invitations were sent to students we felt could really benefit from that additional literacy and or math support. Um, we also had about 25 additional requests from families who said, hey, can, can my student come too? And we didn't turn anyone away. Everyone was invited that expressed interest. 
Um, we had over 100 students who accessed the program in one form or another throughout the summer. We had the opportunity to integrate those pieces. We had a special STEM piece for grade 9 students. They did surveying. They had an opportunity to work with some robotics and some physics. And they were working with teachers. These were the incoming freshmen working with teachers that they would be seeing at the high school so they could start making some of those connections before they got there. For grades 1 through 3 and 4 through 6, we had some collaboration with the Maine Audubon. And they met weekly for the younger grades, for grades 7 and 8. They had a week-long experience with the Audubon coming to us. And then the final day, they went down to the Scarborough Marsh and slogged around, did some, some work with uh, field guides and really getting into the pieces that they've been working with all week. So. We had six CAPE teachers who worked with students. Um, Tom Shaltray, Mary Jane Hamm, Chris Monez, Danielle Kunert, Courtney Farrell, and Evan Thayer. And three of them were able to join us tonight. Uh, we also have four teachers from other districts who joined us. And we had the additional services of a consultant, John Holdridge. You may know him from the telling room in Portland. Um, he worked with us in creative literacy. He did three days of professional development with our teachers prior to the program to really build where we were going and to work with a foundational text for all three grade level groups. We worked with Richard Blanco's um, poem, One Today and really use that to kind of kick off a sense of place, whether it was you know, my bedroom, my town, my, my community, moving into my state, my country, my world. And so the different grade levels had an opportunity to access that where they were, depending upon their developmental understanding of, of place and um, on lots of different levels. You're on. This, yes, I am. This is Chris Monez and Danielle Kuhner. And let's see here. This is not letting me exit. So. Hmm. You promised okay. me. It's here, dear. I promise. But we can, while she's looking for it, we can start by saying, you know, sort of how right it... there. Should I make? No, just come closer no. to the um, phone. You know, how it, it affected us as teachers. Okay. Um, we saw changes in these kids that... Um, you know, who we've had in the regular classroom, who we've enjoyed in the regular classroom very much, but the smiles on their faces coming in through the different experiences, it was a very non-traditional sort of experience for them, and, um, it, and their excitement coming in every morning, and Ruth Allen, um, who might have heard, shared the student who didn't even want to go on vacation, because um, they were so excited to join us in this endeavor. And the other thing that we, we presented this to the junior high, and the one thing I forgot to say is with the three days that we had with John initially, um, he, just, he just helped create such a safe, comfortable um, environment. And I felt like, you know, I can speak for Chris and myself, we, we felt like we were able to do that for the kids, and perhaps that's why we saw some changes in them. And participation, and just the smiles, it was pretty electric. Um. One of the things I'm trying to do is to get to the beginning of this. One of the things we did with the kids in the beginning, with the help of Tom... Sheltry. Sheltry. I have a hard time with um, his name. Um, was set up a Twitter account, and the Twitter account helped us keep track of what we were doing. We wanted to do this so that um, parents and other people could access it. So it's a very private account. So not everybody could get in on the Twitter account. The other thing it did with the kids was, the students was, it had them, we had them doing reflections in their journals daily that were Twitters. So they had to leave them to 140 characters, which was really good because for some of these kids, um, having them limit their writing was a really good way to say you don't have to write on and on and on, but I really want you to think about what you're doing. And if they wanted to, they could enter their Twitter on this and then we would publish it. So it was really like a promo for that. And we refer back to main idea, you know, with keeping it simple and um, 
you know, the, the kids really caught on to that. It's like, if you keep it simple, we can see the main idea that you're bringing to us today. So a lot of the pictures that you're going to see, we don't have faces purposefully because we were trying to keep it very private. So it's, it, it's not that I'm that bad a photographer, it's we were trying not to get people's pictures. Um, when we started that first week, what we did was um, we played a game called, we started with a math kind of activity called Oh Dear, which talks about invasive species and habitat and predators and prey, and we collected data from the game about what was happening when we added invasive species and predators and then we graphed that data and they all created graphs and we worked with that and we talked about those interactions and then they wrote about it. Tom listened to all of that so that later on in the program he used that whole idea and that was what they used as their basis for their coding games. So they created games, they coded their own games online that mirrored that whole idea. So it was kind of a really nice synergy of different teachers all of a sudden getting together and going, oh, okay, I can play off that idea, which was also really neat for all of us. I think that was part of the energy we got was, you know, we had some people in there, we were having a lot of fun, and we really were, and the kids had a lot of fun because of that, and I think that made some of that even more enjoyable. Um, after the next week, we did um, the Audubon experience, which also was, where, this is our, um, some of the kids, hello people, I'm having a good day, the graph, the data collecting was a great task to do for the schedule and it helps us remember what we experienced. So those are actually the kids writing about their day. Um, we started doing a couple of icons and stories and then the next week our seven kids going into seventh and eighth grade went to Audubon, um, but Mr. Thayer, Evan and Courtney worked with kids who were going to the ninth grade and they did some robotics and some physics and some measuring back at school while we went and worked with Audubon. Um, the Audubon people were great. We had this guy who was like the bird expert, and he came and did a lot of work with the kids, and I was a little hesitant at first, but by the end of the week, the kids were saying, oh, wow, can you hear that? It's a... Hearing oh, tweets wow. and, you know, yeah, and chirps and whatever, yeah. So it really, they got a lot more out of it than I had even envisioned, and then he had another naturalist come, and she talked to us about um, discovering different, or looking for different species that we were going to be looking for at the marsh. Our other kids were continuing with the robotics and the measuring. These are some of the, these aren't students, these are um, things from Those Audubon. Those are examples from the Audubon, yeah. <laughs> um, and let's see. This was the measuring activity that the um, kids going into the ninth grade did, which was really cool. They did this measuring activity where, well, this is where they were racing their cars, I guess. So this is more of the speed. They and then, their bodies a lot. Yeah, and then they measured their yeah. bodies, which was here, and used that as, no, that was us, That's us in Audubon. Audubon. Yeah. Anyway, so science, math was the second week, a big push. Um, we started identifying things, so when we did go to the marsh with our kids, they could be um, naturalists and actually provide some data for some citizen science programs, which also was really intriguing, intriguing and um, interest for them, a high interest, being able to do that. We were able to take some iPads from the school and use those. Um, then we came back and... We came back and focused a lot on literacy and taking, you know, considering um, the United States, Maine, Cape Elizabeth, your home, and um, we went through the entire writing process with the kids, um, and they started to create stories. Um, and they started to create stop. stories. What did I do? I don't know. I thought you told me to stop. Oh, no. <laughs> um, so that we, we created stories. They maintained a composition book, a journal, where they had pictures in there. They had their writing in there. They had their, their brainstorming in there. They did a lot of peer editing. Ultimately. We narrowed it down to um, a poem, to poetry. We went, we went back to symbols and had the students all create their own poems. And um, then we, you know, we thought, OK, we don't want everyone to present their own poem. We want to kind of collaborate it together. So um, we, had, we had them all pull. We talked a lot about elevated language. And we had them all pull um, one line from each of their poems. And we you know, cut them into strips and arranged them on a table. And John took a big part in this as well. Yes, Chris? Yes. And um, they, they just sort of put the, the, the lines of poetry in place so that they made sense. And it was a beautiful poem. And then we didn't know John is a lot about um, uh, presenting, you know, publishing. And we're, th we're thinking, how do we go about this? And 
um, we came up with the brainstorm that, I, you know, we counted the kids, we counted the lines of poetry. Can you show them how we ended up doing it? Can you help me show them how we ended up doing it? <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you all this. Yeah, you have to oh, oh, I'm comfortable at showing the video because oh, it has okay. the full kids. Okay, Sorry. so, this yeah, yeah, this is the poem. So we put them in a straight line where they couldn't see anyone, like the person, Chris videotaped and she couldn't see anybody behind me. It started with me. And I read the first line and then I went all the way to the back of the line and out of the room. The second student read the second line, so on and so forth until we got through the entire poem and it was really, really cool. So, neat. And one of the things I said at the end was, um, I'm a math science teacher. Um, it was really exciting for me to spend time this summer doing this kind of work with people who I learned from and learned with and helping kids get engaged and interested in it. Um, because it turned out there, I did a lot of stuff that I can take with me. And even though it sounds weird, I can use it in my science and my math classes. Um, in fact, I'm hoping to get John in there to do a couple of things with me and my students also. So. And certainly the book, A Reason to Teach, is, was our um, homework that we had to do before the whole thing started. And I can't even tell you the amount of information in that book that I can use in my classroom as well. I mean, we teach the outsiders in seventh grade and there's so much information on activities that we can, that we can do. And the kids blew us away, you know. They, they did. They really got into it. They were coming in, kids who we never saw this from, smiles on their faces every day, you yeah. know, joking, laughing, having fun. Um, stuff that both of us would look, would look at kids and go, really, is that that same kid? Yeah. Really surprising. Yeah. So. It, was, it was, and for us together, it was a phenomenal, it made, it made my summer. I know Chris. It made my summer better. Yeah, yeah. it really did. Yeah. So, well, speaking I, from the heart. Wow, <laughs> good. I toured the, the program thank, thanks to Jane Golding on a, on a very sunny, warm day um, when, when uh, it, I thought no child would want to be in the, in the school buildings. And the energy in the rooms was amazing. The kids were, and teachers were obviously engaged in, in what they were doing and, and excited about what they were doing. And I didn't see anyone who looked like they wished they were somewhere else. So congratulations to, to all of you for that. Thank you. Um, thanks. Thank you. That's great. <laughs> That's great. Really um, and just to piggyback on that, I have um, a couple of family responses to the program as well. The teachers were fun and lighthearted. It was not an uptight atmosphere. It's amazing how much they learned in three days a week, three hours a day. Learning was fun. The hands-on experience was better for our students. So, and then I've seen my previously reluctant student become engaged, cooperative, and enthusiastic about attending this program. Um, you know, tribute to the work that the teachers did this summer. It was amazing. It was so much fun to walk through and just see those kids just ready to be there. And it's the type of atmosphere that we really want to bring into everything that we do. So thank you for the opportunity to do it because it was a lot of fun. Thank you. Are there any, any questions? questions? Members of the board? Do they have to be questions or can they be? No, they can be comments. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, everyone who was involved, especially the teachers. I know, um, you know, a lot of times uh, you're, you know, it's an opportunity for you to take chances and do something different. And what struck me is the, the number of times someone said something about it. It was non-traditional. So um, hopefully uh, you know the school board supports all our teachers and um, trying different things and we know um, we hopefully you feel encouraged and it's a safe environment and I know it can be um, challenging to try something different because as we all know if you've tried something new you fail sometimes but that's part of learning so I want to thank you so much for for taking those chances and another thing that struck me is if I uh, you know if we tried to launch a multi-age classroom district-wide next year you know, I'm sure there would be a lot of pushback and uh, we'd have to have a lot of work to do, but it's amazing how if you do something as um, 
unusual or creative as that in the summer. It's a kind of a different environment. So hopefully we can take some of the energy and the experimentation and uh, we learned in the summer and continue that momentum during the school year. So thank you very much. I would also just like to underscore what um, Michael Moore was saying, and, and that is this is a fabulous demonstration on how you can really bring curriculum alive for students and deliver it through multiple pathways and allow each student's learning style to be addressed and get excited about learning. And it's exactly what opening doors and opening minds is all about. So thank you so much for that demonstration. All right, thank you, Ruth Allen. Okay, moving on now to item 4B, the Gifted and Talented program. I think Jane Golding's going to start. Okay, we have Jane Golding. There she is, with an overview. Good evening, thank you. Um, I'm going to do this in a question and answer format and then welcome your questions. So the first question is, GT, gifted and talented, mandated by the state? And yes, indeed it is. Section 104 of the Maine State Law requires that we have a gifted and talented programming process and um, deliver those services. On the website, you will find, indeed, the 2013-2014 gifted and talented program um, process the application, and that was written and always is written in the month of November of a school year and sent to the State Department. We received that back around March, approved. So we will not be writing for the 2014-15 until this November, and probably we'll see that sometime in March of 2015. Um, that plan is there for all to see. We have hired this year a consultant. Her name is Molly Kellogg. She is a certified gifted and talented teacher. Um, we're fortunate to have Molly. She is on maternity leave or family leave from the Yarmouth School Department, has been a practicing gifted and talented educator for many years and does a fine job and is filled with the passion and energy that we are thrilled to have join us. Um, she has been this week and last week meeting with teachers, grades three, four, tomorrow is five, six, and today was seven, eight. Um, her role is to help us with the actual implementation of the gifted and talented screening process. That is for our identification of young people who would fit the identification criteria of gifted and talented. That is about three to five percent of our population. Um, her role also is to work with classroom teachers and, and other educators in our schools to help them put in place um, educational practices to support learners. Um, there was a question posed about models. When would we make a decision about the best model for the Cape Elizabeth schools? And we really aren't going to make a decision about one model um, because our hope is that we are meeting individual student needs. There are, are many, many models, and you can find many, many models on any school department's website in the state of Maine, and you can keep right on going through all the other states. Um, so we don't want to certainly close any doors. We want open doors, and we want to make sure that we're doing what it is our young people need. So by that, I mean some young people will receive what they need right in the classroom with some differentiation. Some young people may have other students come into the classroom, what we call flexible grouping, and, and one teacher may work with them. Um, we may have some sorts of pullouts and some um, project-based learning opportunities for students, certainly as young people age, online um, opportunities are endless, and certainly we've had young people, um, I'm sure for many years in this district, taking college courses as they've entered high school. So. Um, I guess by those examples, I just want to let you know that we're not closing anybody off or, or picking one way to do something, but um, opportunity is there for children. Um, the next steps that we have in place, and this is the timeline for what we are doing this fall. Um, we have been, as I said, meeting with elementary and middle school teachers and introducing the screening process. There, 
this is the time of year when they're getting to know students, so Molly has provided them with some guidelines and some tools that they can use as they watch our students learn. Um, they collect work samples from um, the work students are doing. They, they can look at the information she's provided and say, hmm, that's a great question. I, I, I should make note of that, what s said student asked. Um, and they're keeping all of that information. By um, October 17th, they are to provide the building principal in both the elementary and middle school documentation of a nomination form and student work and information that they have as, it, as teachers about the students. There will be a screening committee that will briefly look at that to make sure we have all the pieces. And during the week of October 20th, that group of students who have been nominated will um, take an aptitude test, which will give us another um, data point. The week after that, the screening committee at each school will then meet and review all of the information. And there is a process that we will go through to award points for different pieces of the um, information and data collected and make identification of three to five percent of the students to um, receive GT services. Parents will be notified all along the way. Um, and then once that is done, Molly and the teachers will begin to meet um, to talk about what it is we'll do to meet student needs. And that's the exciting part. Um, that's what rewards that hard work of teachers in their screening. Initially, we're working just on math and literacy. In um, come January, once the new year rolls over, we will be coming back to meet with folks about science, social studies, and um, performing arts so that we can have that process in place. The normal screening process from now on after this year will always happen in the spring. Every grade will be screened beginning with grade two just a little bit, and then there'll be a little bit more in the third grade as, as they move into third grade. But Three, four, five, six, seven, eight will be rescreened every year. Um, on top of that, we um, are fortunate to have in the district this year John Holdridge, who you just heard about, is working with us um, in special education, and so his work um, certainly is able to work with regular educators as well and talk about young people with needs. So we are sure that some of his great ideas are going to brush off in many, many places. Um, and there also will be some math consultants available on top of Molly who will be here with us throughout the school year. And that is the process. And that's what we're up to. Thank you, Jane. Are there questions? I, sure. I have a myriad of questions, but I'll one at a time. Oh, that would be helpful. <laughs> okay. Um, so is this particular formalized screening this process that you've outlined, is that new? Is this a new practice for our district? Yes. And um, what costs do you see associated with implementing this type of screening tool in our district in a comprehensive way that you've outlined here? Well, there's some time and good thinking. Um, monetarily? Yes. Minimal. Minimal. We purchased an aptitude test. I, I can't quite remember what that cost, but it wasn't no, huge. <laughs> that's OK. And I'm only asking because I'm, I'm reflecting back to a presentation that a parent gave to the mm -hmm. board last spring, mm -hmm. uh, outlining um, the need for our district to implement a comprehensive GT mm -hmm. screening and implementation in our district. And as evidence of our lack of compliance to the state law, he pointed out the dollar amounts that were being spent in other districts, and they seemed pretty significant. Yes. Um, and so the other cost we do have, and I apologize for interrupting, um, is the consultant. And we have um, a budget line for that. Um, and the monies having Maybe you do or don't know, but I did come from Yarmouth and having been responsible for that program for years, there was money that was cited in that presentation that you heard last spring. And that money is a reimbursement process that the state has for the actual salaries of the staff. And Yarmouth employs 1.5 GT educators at this time. 
um, that's, really that's good grown news. through the years. Actually funding a mandate. Um, and they do support a, a bit of materials for that school department. But there is no mandate in the, in the law that says a district must hire a certified gifted and talented teacher. There, is a, there are a variety of ways that school departments meet the requirement. Thank you. Um, and then I think this is my last question. Um, what if parents want to self-refer their children to be screened? Is there a mechanism in place? Absolutely, there is, and it's the identical mechanism that teachers will use. So mom and dad are, are thinking that their young person indeed could be identified as gifted and talented, so get in touch with their teacher. And the forms and the guidelines that we've gone over with teachers will sit and go over with moms and dads, and then they will do the same process. So that means that sometimes moms and dads see their young people at home doing amazing things, we all do, um, and we may not be seeing those things at school, so we would ask mom and dad to bring us evidence of that and to take some notes about the kinds of things they're seeing, hearing, or what their child is doing. And then they would present the same information in the same way the teachers do. And that should be by the same date, which would be the October 17th deadline that we've set. Fabulous. Those are my questions. Okay. Um, so how have we reached out to parents to let them know that this process has begun? And really, it began last year. It began last year. And so while this uh, came up in school board meetings, you were actually deep in uh, the plan, which I thank you, thank you for. Um, so what happens if they meet, miss the October 17th or didn't pick up the paper? How are we informing? Well, the, there was a parent letter, Dear Family, sent K-8 home last week, September 5th. It's also on the website. Okay. And anyone can, watching this, can give a call to either the building principal or to me. That would be awesome. Great. Jane, I know you mentioned, <clears throat> excuse me, the 3 to 5 percent, and I was just trying to understand it sounds like it's going to be math, literacy, and then science, social studies, visual, and performing arts. One would argue you could be gifted and talented in math, and you're not so much in visual and performance arts. So is it conceivable, you know, you could have, you know, 5% in each one. So, in, you know, if there's six different areas, that could be 30%, just because I, I was just trying to understand assessing on six different subject matters versus a different structure just for gifted and talented. So if you could help us understand. percent of our population, period. So um, if we have more young people, certainly who are very bright and, and need, we certainly can find other ways to meet their needs, but we can't identify them. And the state, um, through my years of reporting to the state of the 3 to 5 percent, the initial reports from um, other school departments that I worked for were, you know, oh, we have 15 percent or we have 20 percent, and they'd always send it back and say, no, you have 3 to 5 percent, so tell us who that is and tell us what you're doing. So we um, are following the guidelines. We're, it's, it's always, you know, we have 5 percent, but then who's number six? And number six is tough, but that doesn't mean we're just going to ignore them. So. I guess I was confused because if it's math and language arts and mm -hmm. if you screen for that and gifts and talented, why would we even screen for, in other words, if you select someone they're gifted and talented, I, I was just trying to understand the science, social studies, visual and performance arts. You've already, in other words, is it if a subject? If we've already hit the three to five, don't do that. No, we still would do that. And it may indeed be many of the same young people and it may not. But what we can't do is say we have 30% of gifted students. Oh. So, I have another question now. Are you done? I just had one quick follow-up on the on the plan. I know the thirteen fourteen. Just because I had a few parents ask when they hit mm -hmm. the link, yeah. it has a thirteen fourteen, and the logical question was, well, that that school year is over. So the fourteen fifteen plan will submit. In other words, is there one year we'll catch catch up like? Never will no. catch up because the State Department puts out the application, which is usually a little different every year, um, in November, and it is for the school year. So it will be for the school year 14-15. Okay. They'll put it out in November. Even if I wanted to do it tonight, I couldn't.
Cause just so because it was yes yeah, it was a hard you know someone said well why don't you have the 14 no. fit so I think that's helpful yeah that it, so in November we'll have the one submitted so we'll, ha we'll have the approved one in March for 1415 even though the state knows there's only three months left of the school year that's just the way it works mm -hmm. and yeah I mean that that presents part of the presented part of the challenge for us certainly in implementing this program which was new to the district last year given the timing of the approval and the amount of time left in the school year and the demands that occur at the end of the year it wasn't really practical to go through the full screening process with our teachers in the spring. Um, so it made sense for us to implement that this fall so that we can really maximize the timing, the information provided to teachers, and then be able to provide the supports to children in a thoughtful, systematic way. And again, we won't receive approval probably on this year's plan until sometime in March, but we'll be working on the approved plan that, that is in place. And then my last question is, what is, uh, you know, someone's going to ask, you know, Yarmouth or other surrounding districts may get reimbursed. So what, what do we have to do as a district um, if a decision is made to have a dedicated, gifted, and talented, or whatever costs could be reimbursed, what is the deadline for submitting th that request? That would be part of the budget that would be submitted for the 14-15 um, plan but that doesn't coincide with your budget process necessarily. Um, so ultimately it's your decision and whether you approve that in your budget process and then we could amend, we could approach the state to amend uh, the budget that we would have submitted in November because you're not going to have a budget passed until well past, if I remember correctly, May, well past May March. or June likely. So um, that's, where we can go with that. I guess one last follow up. It would be helpful to have, uh, just so we're notified of that. So if there is a need or a decision made, mm -hmm. even though you want to do multiple models, if there's an opportunity for reimbursement, we at least can know about it and yep. understand it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Joe, did, yeah. did, you have did David have a question? Uh, hmm? Yeah. And, but Joe, if you could just, I think you had a follow-up. Sure. I had a follow-up question to what Michael was asking about, and, and maybe it's because I'm not a gifted and talented student. I just want to make sure I got it. Was you were talking about um, the 5% the and 30% of students who have been identified. Are you identified as a gifted and talented student because of your assessment findings in all subjects, or can you be given enhancement, curriculum enhancements per subject matter? You can, be, you can be gifted in all five, or you could be gifted in one. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to make that clear. You could be gifted in four and bright in five, and still we're going to do something. <laughs> okay. Not that, and I, I think it's really important that to, for people to think or to understand that it's not that we've been ignoring by any stretch. Yeah. Um, there have been many individualized programs that have gone on since the time I've been here that we just haven't, we just do them. We, we don't run around and tell a lot of people. So um, it's not that we've ignored young people's needs. That was my At question. either end of the spectrum, quite frankly. Our job is to meet everyone's needs and we, we work at that every day and we've had some very exciting programming going on for some young people. So. Um, but this is a very much more formalized process than this district has had, from what I can tell, in many years. And so we are going through it very methodically to be sure that we're doing it as it should be and to get it going in a way that will now take care of itself as years go on. Yeah, thank you for underscoring that we have been meeting yeah. students' needs in the classroom. And I would just add that while three to five percent of our students in grades three through eight may qualify as gifted and talented, we still have another 97, 95 to 97 percent of our students for whom we have an obligation and a responsibility to provide a thoughtful, structured, responsive academic program that's going to meet their needs. And that's our focus on differentiation. That's what our response to intervention teams are about. Response to intervention is not about remediation. It's about instruction. It's about meeting kids where they are and helping them make growth.
David? Um, Jane, I, I have two questions, and I, you may have answered it, and quite frankly, I think I have low blood sugar, and I didn't hear okay. it. But um, you keep using the figure 3 to 5 percent. I am kind of stunned that we only have 3 to 5 percent kids in grades 3 through 8 who are gifted and talented. Is that a cap? Is that what the test showed? Um, have the tests been done? Is that what teachers estimate? How did that figure get arrived at? And is it a cap? If the 3 to 5 percent comes from the law. The so, state law about gifted and talented. So, so they Schools may not identify more than 5 percent. Okay, so just so I understand and so the public understands, if we have basically MIT here mm -hmm. and everybody is far better than Lake Wobegon, they're well above average, we, we cut off at 5 percent even if the 6 percent is Einstein. So we report to the state that we have identified 3 to 5 percent and we serve three to five percent with our gifted and talented programming and the other 97 to 95 percent of the students who are all MIT um, we will serve through differentiation and all of the good practice that we have going on so no one is missing out but the State Department is very clear that we can only identify three to five percent if I may add, I have a follow-up question to that and it's really some for us all to think about if the state says 5 percent, that doesn't mean we as Cape can't say 15 percent and we'll pay the difference. Is that correct? Well, we can say anything we'd like the, to, yes. The, the state can say, well, 5 percent of gifted and talented. And we say, that's, that's nice. That works in, I don't want to name a town in Maine, but that works in some town in Maine, but in Cape, we have 25 percent and you'll pay for five and we'll pay for the rest. We could do that. And I guess I would argue, David, that to some degree we already do. I mean, that is the job of our teachers, is to provide high quality instruction to every learner. And I hear your point. We certainly, if we wanted to provide a different level of service or provide a different program, that's an option. Right. But I guess what I'm saying is, I understand we do, but gifted and talented must mean something. We must provide something in addition for being the gifted and talented program. And to say that we're covering everybody else just as well sort of means, then why do we have a gifted and talented program? It doesn't do something in addition. I'm just... But the point is... Because it's I, required by law. No, I understand. I, I'm, I'm, I guess I am low on blood sugar. I fully understand that. And what I'm trying to make a point is that we can run a gifted and talented program in compliance with the law, but we can do more than that if we have more than gifted and talented people. And that may require money, and I think it's something we should consider. So I, I think I've got my... Do I debate in your answer? I got my answer. <laughs> and I guess I'm, my other word doesn't tell me what my second question was. So if anybody else has a question, I'll take, try to I go. do have a, a question that's related to yours, and, and that is why does the state then cap it at 5%? Is that because they're putting money behind it? That's a bigger question than me. I'm, okay. I'm really not sure about the state's thinking with this because they've waffled back and forth. One year it's mandated, one year it's not. The 3 to 5% has always been there from the time I've been practicing with that. So that's the past 15 years. And so I, I I'm sorry. Why? And I would say that's consistent with sort of what why? national norms are around students who are considered gifted and talented, students who are scoring two or more stay nines above where their normal typical peers might fall in terms of standardized assessments. That's, this all de derives from sort of standardized IQ testing, right. wherever so you fall on that. these are kids who are that. way beyond proficient with distinction? Potentially. Like we that. only assess certain areas in proficient with distinction right. <laughs> terms. Yeah. Uh, if I, I'm sorry. Oh, I, I, just, I just wanted to ask a basic question. Um, who comprises the screening committee? Is it so so this year, in each school, it's the building administrator, the principal, um, Ruth Ellen Vaughn, our director of instruction. Um, I am sitting on that committee this year, and I'll explain why I am keep saying this year. Classroom teachers, our school psychologist, guidance counselor. This year, Ruth Ellen and I are sitting on that committee so that we can all be on the same page and make sure we're all in doing the process with great um, energy and focus and making sure we're doing the very best we can. Next year that committee will not include district personnel because there needs to be an appeal level. So the school level screening committee makes a decision, mom and dad are not 
in agreement, and so they have an appeal level. They first would go to that committee, and then they could come and sit and talk with us as well. So that's a little bit out there in the process. This year, we're all in it together. So, so each, uh, well, at least this year, all the teachers and all the grades will be part of it? No, teacher representatives. Okay. We, okay. This is an all-day process that will happen during that week of October 27th that I explained, and so we'll be pulling people out of providing subs for them so that they can spend the day working on the screening committee. I, I figured out what my other word was. Okay, David. I, 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 in fairness, people on TV don't think I'm, I'm blacking out. I did do a hard bike ride, and I did not eat enough before I came here, so it's a good lesson for everybody not to do that. I wrote down the word high, and I didn't put the word school, so now I know what the word high means. Okay. Why? What about high school? This is three through eight. Right. We are focused on three through eight. High school, typically, um, we don't do the same screening process. Typically, in our high schools, we, first of all, don't have a lot of requests um, because we offer AP. We naturally offer through the guidance system and, and the other natural work that goes on at the high school, the online courses. If we have young people ready to take college courses, they're doing it. We, we never stand in the way of that. Those opportunities are all there. So we don't typically see those kinds of um, referrals or needs, and, and that is common in this so, practice. So if I could circle back, again, for people in the audience, and I'm more familiar with high school because my son graduated recently, there, there is so many opportunities there through AP courses, through we, we have very high level math, science, other courses that even if you're a freshman, you can and you qualify, you can take senior courses, we take uh, online courses, we go to colleges. We basically mold a gifted and talented program um, more naturally there because of our levels and extra courses and different grade courses you can take early and so forth. Is that basically how it works? Correct. Thank you. Same thing for the arts. Thank you. Most certainly. And Jane, while this, we're launching this program, I think it might be helpful uh, the reality is your child could be gifted and talented under the eyes of this state, it sounds like, in fourth grade, and they, you know, for some reason in fifth grade, um, they may not be screened as such. So I know it's difficult conversations that obviously could happen, but even though it's, you know, that's just, I guess, the reality of, of the process. But could you confirm if, if that scenario could that, happen? That is the reality of the process, and the reason is that we all know that young people move into our district. The cohort changes every year, and so it may be that the five, the top five, um, changes because someone moved in and, and now they're six. And that's the difficult conversation. That doesn't mean then that you, doesn't mean I was gifted today and I'm not tomorrow. I'm still just as gifted. It's just that in the identified group, they're not there. But that doesn't mean we're ignoring them, and I, I guess I keep wanting to tell you that we're not ignoring children. So, but that, but this process, because it is formal, and because we are following it very carefully, will bring those tough conversations to the forefront. Great, thank you, Sierra. Yeah, um, I know that we are a non-ranking school, and we talked a lot about our school climate in the past, and I feel like, I mean, at least personally, being someone who is uh, like. Would, might may have classified for gifted and talented and not made it. Um, I don't. I feel like that would have added a lot of stress to students before it was even necessary. Like in second grade, you're the top five in your class. I, I guess my question is, how are you going to avoid that um, added stress on the climate? That's a tough one. Did well, I was going to say, and I think. I appreciate that question so much, Sierra, because I would say we hear that from students even now. Yeah. Um, a couple of our administrators received a letter from a student entering fifth grade who shared sort of what the experience was like to not make it into accelerated math and how that student felt like she didn't measure up and wasn't good enough. And I think that that is a really important message for all of us to think about, that we need to make sure every student feels like they're good enough, that they matter, that they ha recognize their own strengths and talents, and make sure that they are being honored for what they bring to the table. I think it's an education process for all kids about, it, John may be really great at science, but you're really great at math. 
And that's okay. That's part of who you are. And you may need some different things for the things that you're really great at, and he may need some different things from the, for, for what he's really great at, and that's part of how a school community works. It's our job to help you get what you need, and that may not always look the same. So I guess, will the gifted and talented students be like, be published? Will it be a public thing to know that your, I guess your peers are gifted and talented? Okay. No, that's not published information, and it's um, certainly not common conversation. Um, a, a student or a family may choose to disclose that. They always can. Um, but that's no different than any other um, identification that they may have. Oh, I have um, arthritis. And so, you know, and that's why I need a little of this or a little of that. Um, so it, that's a great, great question, and that's really important. We are not publishing this. Um, it is to make sure that we're not missing doing the kinds of educational programming that we need to do for every young person. Just as we identify young people who need a little more help, um, we also don't publish that information, so it's really important. The, this, you all should be very proud of the work that you have supported in that area of differentiation. I had a long conversation with someone from the State Department last spring about what was happening in this district on behalf of all students, and um, I was explaining to the person on the phone about the 60 people that had been in the first cohort for differentiation and then that we had a large number of people going to the University of Virginia this summer to also participate in a seminar there and that another 60 would participate this coming school year and the other cohort from last year would continue to receive support. And the, finally the person said, excuse me, are you saying six or 60? I said 60. Oh my, she, she really could not believe it. She was just amazed at the number and, and the focus that we have on this and the continued focus, the sustained work that we're continuing with because that's not usual. Districts do differentiation and I say that and I don't mean it in any derogatory way, but they do it and we did it and now we'll do something else. That's not the case here. The case is we really want to make a difference for every young person and we want to make sure we're meeting the needs and not separating and pulling out and identifying the, the energy and excitement and the passion you saw from the folks from this summer and the kinds of opportunities of learning we saw for all of the students, whether they had real learning needs or they were indeed quite gifted at some things because we had some young people that were just shining was amazing. And nobody was identified anywhere and nobody could pick anyone out. It was a little test I gave John when we went around. Could you tell me which student needed what? He couldn't. That's awesome. That's the way it's supposed to be. You're absolutely right. Jane, I, I, this conversation's been, been enlightening, I think, in terms of uh, exposing uh, how much um, we all realize that each child has, is going to have different needs um, mm -hmm. and that this, it's the work of, of schools and teachers to uh, identify those needs and, and, and make sure that they're being addressed for, for each child, regardless of whether they, they fall in that 3 to 5 percent or among the vast majority of students who are not going to fall in that, in that 3 to 5 percent. And so, which is why you're talking about the, the district's focus on differentiation. Um, I just want to clarify that the, the groups of 60 that you were talking about, 60 last year and 60 this summer, are 60 teachers from our district yes. who have received multi-day training in differentiated instruction. So it's been a significant professional development emphasis of the district to, to provide that training to teachers. Um, and I, I do have a question that's, that's coming. Um, and so because that uh, ability to assess students' needs and then provide differentiated instruction to meet those needs is so important. I'm wondering whether the assessment that you're doing uh, with kids who, who may be potentially identified as gifted and talented, is that an assessment that can be useful in terms of um, helping us understand the needs of students regardless of whether they eventually become identified as gifted and talented or not? Because I know assessment is the is the very important first step of mm -hmm. differentiated instruction is to understand, okay, I have 22 students in my classroom. You know, what, what, what are, where are they? Where are each of them? 
in, in, you know, in, in the subject matter and what, what focus do they need um, and so forth. So can this assessment help or, or, or is this a tool that was only useful for us in terms of gifted and talented and we're going to be using other assessments for developing uh, strategies for differentiated instruction? So the tool we're using for GT is called the COGAT, and it is specifically for gifted and talented and recommended for just that. It's an aptitude test. Um, and I, maybe Ruth Allen would like to chime in on the differentiation. I'll, I'll give you my spin on it and my two cents. But um, the reality is that pre-assessment happening in classrooms prior to instruction is really important for educators to do and that's a big part of what we've been talking about in differentiation PD that you've talked about, the professional learning opportunity. And that really is tailored to whatever unit and whatever content teachers are teaching. So there's a pre-assessment that happens to, to understand where students are with their learning and all of a sudden teacher realizes, oh, you're really down the road, you really are great at this so I'm going to extend your learning this way and this group over here needs a little more instruction, so here's how I'm going to work with them. And that flexible grouping and that, that conversation um, really needs to happen at the beginning of unit instruction and then along the way, the more formative assessments that teachers do. How's it going? Are we getting there? What do I need to reteach? Are we ahead of the game? Those kinds of things. And then finally, your summative assessment. But I would well, turn to you. To add to that, one of the, I think, in talking with teachers this week about the screening process, one of the most valuable pieces that's coming out of that is the tools that they've been given to give a different lens of how they look at their students. And while they may be using those tools to try to identify maybe the top three to five percent, it's really giving them another lens to look at students is this student maybe not doing as well in class because his needs aren't being met rather than the fact that he's just lazy or not getting the work or is there something else behind that and I think this process can allow us to really see students across the board in a different light and allow us better avenues to differentiate as well. So while I would say it wouldn't be just the COGAT, but the whole screening process, the way that teachers are looking at student work, really listening to the type of interactions they're having with teachers, with their peers, what are they asking, how are they writing, what's the difference that they're seeing, I think that is a real benefit to this process for everybody, not just that top three to five percent, because the goal is differentiation across the board. It's not just to meet one population or another, it's to meet the hundred percent. Thank you. Um, and it underscores Ciara's question really about the social and emotional needs of our students. And, and before I get to the question, I'll sort of couch it by saying, I think that both families and students experience an enormous amount of stress in our district as far as the pressure to excel. And I know from watching through experience through my own children's eyes that everybody knows who that kid is. Whether that kid is somebody who's getting extra instruction because they need help or whether that kid is getting extra help because they really belong in another grade level. And it, it sets kids up in a very, can be in a very stressful social and emotional setting. So how well we implement this in a more formal way are we ensuring that we can at least minimize that effect in, our, in the peer groups? And I think that's really where differentiation really comes to the fore because if we're truly meeting each student, then you're receiving something different from me becomes the norm as opposed to the exception when it's it's not just this student getting it that student getting it and the other 20 are getting this it's we have flexible groups and this week you're getting this and that week you're in a different group and it's a constant flow and more likely to be okay now I'm doing this and I'm working on this project and you have that project and it's not singling out kids it's playing to everyone's strengths and it's meeting everyone's needs. 
And that's a process, and that's why we're spending a lot of time in training teachers about that process and how best to deliver that differentiated instruction. But really, that's the goal, that it's, it's going to be that for everyone as opposed to singling out and making it obvious, where it's just, this is the way we do school, and this is what instruction looks like. So done well, it should help to minimize some of that. Just to add to that, I will say initiatives like Peaceful Pond Cove, like our advisory models at the middle school and high school, I think are another support. And I think it's important for us, and there's work to do, certainly, as you know, Sierra has indicated, within our school cultures, within our community, around it's okay that we need different things. That's how life works. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to be really clear about that message with students in our schools and, and as families supporting them in that message. We're not all gonna be exactly the same. We're not all gonna excel at everything. We're all gonna have things we're great at. We're all gonna have things we need help with and that's okay. And we should expect that and that's part of life and part of growing up and part of getting to know who you are as a learner and what you're gonna need to be successful in your life and I think we have to make that okay for kids. Because if we don't, that stress is gonna compound and it's gonna continue to, to put kids in positions where they feel like they don't measure up. And I don't think that's what we're after. The, the fact that the committee is made of the counselors as well as, you know, you've already done it, Meredith. You've already given kids what they need in the beginning so that our going forward this is based out of people who know the whole child and the social emotional needs, which is great. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. Appreciate the presentation. Okay, moving forward, item 4C. Summer professional development. I think that's you. No, actually, oh, it's Ruth Ellen. We just sat down. <laughs> She's back, trying to get her notes. In an effort to keep things fairly brief, because we have given quite a bit of information tonight, um, I've broken down, just kind of done an overview of the professional development. So we've already talked about this summer. Um, can be really segmented into three sections. We had training, we had curriculum development, and we had some action teams that were working on projects. Training, one of the big pieces, going back to, again, that differentiation piece, we had 13 of us who went to the University of Virginia for a week um, with the Institute for Academic Diversity. Uh, an amazing week. Uh, we met with Carolyn Tomlinson and um, really had a chance to dig into what is differentiation, what does it look like, what are some of the things that we need to wrestle with as a district at an administrative level to make this happen, what are some of the pieces on an instructional level to make this happen. Uh, we had a number of administrators, we had several teachers, um, both regular ed, special ed represented, and um, a lot of time to kind of process after the meeting say, okay, what does this look like? What does this mean? What are our next steps? Now what do we do? How do we take this back? And what do, what do we really dig in with the work? Um, we also had quite a bit of work with the creative literacy this summer with John Holdridge and really starting to look at how can we do things differently? How can we kind of get out of the box and, and make things more accessible to students on multiple levels. It's that multiple pathways of instruction again, which gets back to the differentiation. How can we present material in a way that's going to make it the most accessible to the most number of kids? Um, we had advisory training for uh, the high school and um, again, that gets back to how do we meet kids where they are, but on perhaps more of a social and emotional level. And iPad training um, for teachers across the district at all levels was available. Um, high school also did some Play-Doh training so that we can work on making sure that kids have the skills that they need, particularly as we start to transition into the proficiency-based diploma, which we do have a little bit of a step back with our extension, but it's not a, we're still moving. Curriculum development, um, advisory curriculum was developed for the middle school. Uh, Full-day kindergarten curriculum was worked on, content area, math, world language, science, writing, and social studies across grade levels, 
and quite a bit of work at the middle school level on essential questions, those big ideas that connect curricula across disciplines. The grade levels are looking to see if they can have thematic ideas that carry across the different disciplines rather than have this just, just English, this is just social studies, this is just math, but how do they connect? Because it's those connections that help kids to, to grab onto what they're looking at. We also had action teams uh, working on the Peaceful Pond Cove project, um, and several of the grade level teams met together to work on common expectations, because it's again that culture and climate piece of how do we make this an environment for kids that is going to be conducive for their learning. So that's a nutshell. Any questions? Thank you. That's a tremendous amount of work. <laughs> I do have one quick question. Sure. Um, I'm always big into evaluations after people have um, uh, taken courses. And I'm wondering, have we asked for any evaluations from the teachers who have taken those courses? What kind of feedback have they given to what they learned and, and how they're going to be able to wrap their head around and implement differentiated instructions in our classroom? Um, I was at this point, it is mostly verbal, but there is an expectation that those teachers will be going back and presenting to their peers within, the, within their building levels to be implementing some of those pieces, be willing to help model some of those pieces for their, their peers and to really start to process what they've learned and share. And so that's the big piece there is to share what they've learned. It's not just, okay, I've got this and I'm going to hunker back in my own room. And get. But it's more the go forth and, and spread the light a little bit. So that's really more the, that piece for the UVA trip. Um, for the creative literacy pieces, we had a couple of ambassadors here tonight that were very excited. And again, a lot of that has been feedback that we've gotten from teachers. We did have a specific survey instrument for the teachers that were in summer school. Um, and what they got out of the process and then just how they want to share that with their peers. And we have some very excited ambassadors that are they're spreading that in their schools as quickly as they possibly can. So that part's fun. So. With respect to most of the action team work, that's those are ideas that are generated by teachers and from buildings. So they are essentially, instead of providing evaluations, they're providing summaries of their work because right. they're the ones initiating that work. Um, so the evaluation is essentially, here's what we did, not how we felt about working on it together, right. if that makes sense. If, if the seventh grade team is working on seventh grade social studies a unit, then what they're submitting in terms of evaluative materials is here's the unit that we worked on as a seventh grade team, as opposed to here's our feedback about what it was like to work together on this unit. Right. So there's a mix of activities. I, I mean, I think your larger point is at, in terms of district offerings, are we collecting feedback on that? And well, actually, my, I was trying to drive at how are teachers receiving the different instruction methods? Um, are they comfortable in what they're learning and, and are feeling good about being able to implement differentiated instruction. From what I understand, it's a, it's a very new way of, of... Well, I would say it's not a very new way, but um, it is, it, we had all the teachers who participated last year filled out surveys after every session, so after every mm -hmm. session that they participated in, they completed surveys. The rate on a one through five scale, the ratings were pretty consistently fours and fives. Okay. Um, in That's, terms of the mm -hmm. quality of their experience. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Thank you. Thank you, Rebellion. Okay, item 4D, School Board Special Ed Law Training. This um, yep. item was added to the agenda at the request of a board member. It has to do with um, the uh, professional development of our school board in terms of our understanding of, um, of special education law, um, which, is, uh, which, is a, which is a large and complex topic. Um, this, so I think what we, what we talked about um, uh, putting forward to the board are, are various ways in which we could 
uh, participate in additional learning around uh, special education law. Uh, and so this is our opportunity to just discuss that a little bit. Um, uh, there typically uh, after uh, elections when we have new board members, we have the, the uh, district's legal advisors come in and, um, and uh, work with new board members on um, the, res the, the responsibilities of being a board member and the, and the matters of law that the board members need to be aware of, including instructional support law. Um, and special ed law, um, and, um, and that's something that uh, could, could well uh, happen again um, at some point this year. Uh, alternatively, we can work with, um, we could dedicate a workshop um, to, uh, to that, but um, uh, typically we set our workshop agendas when we do our um, annual goals setting um, and for the balance of this school board year which runs through December um, those workshops are more or less booked um, the other, and so did we talk about a third well the third would be to set a special training session um, specifically focused around that topic, which could be led by an outside facilitator, whether that's legal, a legal, one of our legal consultants, or by um, someone from within the district. And um, that might be sort of the most efficient approach to take if that's something the board wants to take up. There's a cost to and that. So that's a matter but, of uh, the co um, cost, right? But there is, the board does have a small professional mm -hmm. development budget, budget that could be, could be tapped for that, for that purpose. Could I make an additional alternative suggestion? Absolutely. Um, I'm willing to bet Jane is very familiar with special education law. And I'm willing to bet she could probably find some select articles for lay people like us, uh, both Maine and federal, and give us a packet that we could review. And I'm not trying to overburden Jane with more tasks, but. Um, I think if we got that packet and read it, uh, sort of an in-house one-hour session with Jane, and obviously Meredith is highly knowledgeable about special education, it's just a cheaper, more in-house possible alternative. I just throw it out there. Thank you. Are there other, anyone else have thoughts on I think I think that's great. I think it's, because we can't talk about children specifically, um, I've always felt uncomfortable sitting on the board not knowing what the new laws ha have impacted the way we teach and the way we address children and then the, really the parents' um, frustration with how as you, you know, special ed law affects their child. And so that's really what I'd like to get to we're not going to be able to get to it from one child to one teacher. So um, if Jane could pick uh, some, some of the changes in the law that have happened in the last few years that look like they're impacting a majority of our, or some of our students, that would be helpful to have background knowledge. Is yeah, I mean, I think it, special education law is very complex and there are many layers to it. I think, you know, essentially the, the basics of the training are what does the law require? What are the steps in the process? What, is, what, is, what are the roles of various folks in the process? Parents, child, team members, um, and what happens if the process isn't working? And I think that's really the, the, biggest, the bigger picture from a board perspective. Um, and certainly that's something we can provide you training with, but it may be helpful to, ha to hear that from someone who is trained as an attorney and who does that for a living. I don't have a particular preference about that. I think you know, we, we can take any approach to it and whether Jane does it or I do it, uh, it is not uh, you know, a concern for me or whether we have someone from outside do it. I think the question really is, is this something the board as a whole is interested in doing? And if so, can we reach consensus on what approach you'd like to take? I have uh, really no interest in understanding the law itself. Um, 
in, in terms of, as a board member, I'm more concerned with how are we implementing the law as the district, how are we meeting the required needs of students. I'm sure it's going to be a gigantic book or lots of articles and on that different legal minds have different interpretations and you can't implement all these and it changes a lot. So I'd be more focused on, you know, what are, what are the responsibilities of the district and how are we meeting those responsibilities. I'm not saying that's something we have to do, but kind of going through the law itself, I, my little mind, I wouldn't be able to add much value, to be honest with you, in, in, in terms of we would just have to ask a legal mind or someone, well, what does this really mean? So. My proposal would not be to have you to recite chapter and verse of the law, but but the law as a way of understanding what the responsibilities of the district are. So, if I may jump in, my legal mind now is even smaller than it used to be, and I don't want to hear the law. But I can tell you, having lectured in many places on equally complex subjects, there is, a, and I used to lecture to lay people as well as lawyers. There is a very easy way to make this comprehensible almost anything comprehensible to lay people. It takes a skill. I think our skills lie here with people who know it and also know what you want to know, Michael, how we're doing it here. And my suggestion is, we used to call it, you know, funny book law uh, or comic book law. You basically give the basics. That's all we really need to know. You just, uh, you being Meredith, just aptly said the, the major categories of what we need to know. Give us that, and then how are we meeting it? And I think the best people is, I'll be shocked by the, I'm not a member of the bar anymore, so who cares? Um, the best people to do that are not gonna be lawyers. The best people are gonna be our administrators. That's my view. I'm great with that, with that idea. Is that, is, how do, how do how's other people feeling about that approach? Is that a reasonable request to uh, a busy, administrative team that um, some material be put together? That... Yeah, and again, I would say more importantly than the materials, I mean, I think we could give you a one-page handout that summarized the responsibilities of the district with the request of special education law. I think the details are in sort of the conversation and the discussion and helping people understand how to interpret those requirements. So we could, we could read materials and then set aside some time to have a conversation mm -hmm. without uh, bringing in someone from the outside that would cost the district money. I, I would strongly support that type of approach. <clears throat> Plus, we already have the um, delegation that we are all invited to in Augusta that we can learn more, and then Maine, uh, we get another monthly newsletter about changes in law. Um, so with those, that's great. May I suggest if we do the packet route to help guide conversation and discussion. One of the ways that we have done this in the past is after reading the materials, if there are further questions or areas for clarification, submit questions and that might gauge whether we need a workshop or whether just addressing those in a business meeting with a presentation might suffice. Okay. Thank you all for that input and uh, we'll keep you posted. Thank you. Uh, so, item 4E, the superintendent's report. Okay. This one I know is you. <laughs> this one is me. Yes, thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so, as some of you may be aware, we did have some power issues yesterday um, in all of our schools initially due to a fault in the line. Um, initially, we weren't sure where that fault was, but once CMP arrived, they were able to trace the fault. Um, learned that it was not between the street and the Pond Cove Middle School complex, but rather in the line that runs underground. You may remember this from our capital improvements plan discussion, but the direct burial line that runs between the middle school Pond Cove building and the high school that is buried under our tennis courts. Um, and so yesterday our public works crew um, came and helped dig up once um, CMP had determined roughly where the fault was, um, came and dug up the area between our tennis courts um, about eight feet underground to find the fault in the line. Fortunately, they were able to repair that, um, but in order to access that area, we had to cut power to the high school entirely, which resulted in us sending high school students home. At noon yesterday, um, they were really sad. Weren't you guys sad? <laughs> 
It was a beautiful day. <laughs> Fortunately, it was a beautiful day. Uh, there was great cooperation among everyone involved, from our facilities folks to our transportation folks, our food service folks who were preparing meals in the dark, um, <laughs> and um, our transportation folks helped move food from our coolers at the high school building over to the Pondcook Middle School building where power was restored. So it was a rather complex day, but um, thanks to our teachers for their great spirits and energy and being flexible in, in a challenging situation. And um, the students should be relieved to know that they will not have to make up that day of instruction because we didn't dismiss until after the lunch period. And so it counts as an instructional day. Um, and we hope that we don't see a repeat of that issue before next year's capital improvements are um, go into effect. And again, this particular aspect of the replacement of the power line, so it would run from the street to the high school directly and conduit rather than direct ferry, um, would hopefully take place during the next summer um, and start prior to the start of the next school year. Question. Yes, ma'am. When that happens, what are the chances of being able to bring power to the snack shack? <laughs> but believe me, that's a recurring theme. Um, I've had several conversations with Jeff Thorek and with Greg Marles about it, and Public Works has heard about it as well. We don't have the capacity right now to do any more than we're doing. Um, that's, again, one of the reasons that we've proposed that power upgrade in the 10-year capital improvements plan, because we are underpowered for our needs at the high school today. And so once we increase the power load, we should be able to accommodate the snack shack. I will relay them. I will not sign that in blood, if it has but that is my understanding of the capacity <laughs> that we will now have, or have at that time. So that's power. Meredith, did we lose any refrigeration, any food, did it, a wasteful? Fortunately, no, because we were able to, with the support of our staff, yeah. relocate that food um, prior to any loss. We were looking at all sorts of contingencies. We also fortunately did not lose any of our technology equipment. Um, we do have some panels that blew at the middle school once they restored power. There was a surge, um, so it blew some panels. We anticipate that that will be covered by insurance, and so um, Greg Marles, our facilities director, is working with Scott Wyman, our business administrator, on submitting a claim for those Thank you. losses. Okay. Um, just related to that, that was a good timely use of our Facebook page. So if you haven't seen our Facebook page, we do have a district Facebook page now that's up and running. You can link to it from our home page, but it is a good resource for information, particularly on days like yesterday. Um, we had a great opening of school all the way across. Yesterday was the first day of kindergarten, so while it started a little bit in the dark, they were not in the dark at all. They were bright and cheerful and happy to be there, um, but it was a great start at all of our schools. Our enrollment figures are enclosed in your packet. And sort of as had been projected, um, we are for the first time in a decline over what had been fairly stable enrollment for the first three years. We've gone from 1672 last September. Uh, our current numbers are 1645. Again, these are preliminary numbers for the fall. My recommendation um, would be that we look at updated enrollment projections prior to the start of this year's budget cycle, because I think it's important to have the most accurate information we can moving forward around sort of what to anticipate in our schools. So I've asked for, um, I've asked Scott Wyman, our business administrator, to get a quote um, on enrollment projections from um, planning decisions was the group that was used the last time that those enrollment projections were done here, which I believe was winter of 2011. Yeah. That's right. Do the, our student numbers include students who are, uh, went to charter schools? No, but you'll see those listed. Um, and a, there's a separate line that lists the number of students attending charter schools. As, as of this time, we're aware of seven. So, so we have seven, but they're not included in the enrollment? Correct. They're not part of our 1645 number. The 1645 are children attending physically our schools on campus. But some date in the future, will they'll be included in our enrollment for state aid purposes, or isn't there some? <laughs> no, we are, their state aid follows them to their charter schools. We pay their state aid formula goes there as well as basically the average cost of charter schools. So each of those students attending charters is roughly an $8,000 ballpark um, cost to the district. But, but at some point in the future, won't it be included, like when uh, we get our state subsidy at 
from general purpose A, I thought it would be, you know, even if we get only $1,200 per student, right. even though we're paying the money out, and ironically, they'll be included as a student for That's that correct. formula. They, okay. they currently are. Some of, some of these students were not necessarily attending schools with us before. They might have been homeschooled or attending in a private school. So we were not receiving subsidy for those students, and we will not receive it in the first year. We will ultimately receive those subsidies in the second year for any students who weren't previously counted okay. among our student body. So yes, we will receive state subsidy for those students, and then we will transfer that state subsidy in the form of tuition the state subsidy amount plus whatever the difference is between the calculated charter school cost to the charter schools. Okay. And the moral of the story is that it's still a net negative outflow of funds per student. Yes. And if I may explain negative outflow of funds, <laughs> <laughs> it's just I feel like that's my job to make things simple because I'm a simpleton. But the reality is we are paying these charter schools. We don't get much money. We get a small subsidy from the state that gets passed on. We then make up a large chunk of money uh, by paying them to go to the charter schools, yet we still have the same overhead and teacher costs here. Correct. Just so people get the full bleak picture of this. That was what I call negative outflow. Sorry. Okay. So we'll update you on a cost for enrollment projections, but I anticipate that we will that I will be recommending that we move forward with pursuing that um, information prior to the start of the budget season. Um, with respect to summer work, you've heard a lot of the things that were going on over the summer. I want to credit our facilities, maintenance, custodial crews for tremendous work. We had a lot of projects going on this summer to include renovation of the kindergarten wing, um, to include replacement of the gym floor at the high school, which couldn't start until after Beach to Beacon, so it was still being well, it wasn't sanded yesterday. I believe polyurethane is being applied in the dark for part of the day. Um, so, so there are a number of projects that work. In addition to the routine maintenance and cleaning that goes on at the school, we had the boiler installation project going on at Pond Cove Middle School. There was just a lot of work to coordinate this summer. So um, I appreciate all of their efforts and um, looking forward to getting those new boilers kicked on this winter. We hope it will improve. Um, access and temperature and climate control and energy efficiency, more importantly, um, in our schools. Also want to compliment our technology staff who once again are deploying innumerable um, devices to students and staff across the district. Last Thursday evening was the iPad distribution night or iPad information night for parents of seventh graders who are receiving one-to-one -one devices for the first time. It was well attended and, from what I understand, ran fairly smoothly. Um, we are still in the process of distributing some of those devices. There was a little hold up yesterday on um, device distribution because not all devices were fully charged. And to provide access, you need fully charged devices in order to upload student information. Um, so that is still going on, but we anticipate that all devices will be sent home um, within this, by the end of this week is my latest understanding. Um, we have, um, in addition to that, we are working on our fall sort of screening assessments. Our universal assessments are being implemented as early as next week um, across all schools again. Um, so another heavy lift um, on the part of our technology staff as well as our teaching staff and um, Ruth Ellen and Noel Haroff, our technology coordinator, who are trying to pull all of those pieces together as well as our database facilitator and um, just logistically coordinating all of those devices and all of the students and all of that information is, is a challenge, as you can imagine. Facebook page I hit. Staff recognition. So every fall at our opening district meeting, we recognize teachers for their years of service. You will see that that list was included in your packet. Um, left off of that list, and again, this happens almost every year, I think. Someone is inadvertently left off, but I want to acknowledge uh, Betsy Goldstein and Siobhan Vogel, who both have five years of service to the district who are not included on your list, but who we will recognize um, in their schools in the near future. Uh, proficiency diploma extension letter. So in your packet, you also receive a copy of a letter from the commissioner noting that the district has been granted an extension on um, developing the proficiency-based diploma system. 
we applied for an extension under option five, and option five essentially says we're working on it, but we need more time. And um, we incorporated in our request to the commissioner the details, and you saw this in the spring, but the details of our strategic plan where we outlined our plan towards working towards standards-based reporting and proficiency-based graduation requirements. Um, at this time, we have until the graduating class of 2021 to put these requirements into place, but that, again, for us means there's a significant amount of work to do over the next several years. Our plan, as we've shared with you, is to begin that work in middle school so that by the time students reach high school, there will be some familiarity with standards-based reporting on the part of both students and parents. And um, we will have then been able to sort out all the complicating pieces that are involved in building transcripts that are also standards-based reports um, in order to be able to share those with colleges and universities by the time students who will graduate in the class of 2021 have entered their first year of high school. Any questions on that? I think the extension is great because it gives colleges a chance to get used to everything before we, our kids come along. And I, I know it's a huge amount of work and appreciate the work that's being done. Okay, why not? Let's see, in, also included in your packet are some updated strategic plan measurements. We're not slated to spend time really talking about these tonight at length, um, but we heard feedback last year from both teachers, from the board, from our administrative team as we sort of rolled out a draft of this last spring. We've taken some time to incorporate that feedback between tonight and our next meeting in October. Administrators are sharing these measures with faculty in their buildings for feedback. Um, the administrative team, the district leadership team, will be meeting in late September to review that feedback, I believe the 24th. I don't know if that's accurate or not, but that's the date in my head. Um, I believe around the 24th of September to review that feedback, to make revisions, and then share these back with you um, with the hopes of having them before you for your consideration for adoption in October. Thank you for that. It's been a long process and I know board members provided a tremendous amount of feedback as well, which was helpful to us as an administrative team in thinking about what matters for you as we um, move forward with this work. Let's see. Open houses are coming up. High school is tomorrow night at 6.15, Mr. Shedd. Um, fifth and sixth grade open house at the middle school is next Tuesday at 6 o'clock which will also coincide with the grand opening of the Library Learning Commons. There was a great article in last week's Current, if you haven't seen it, about the Library Learning Commons. And I want to thank CIF again for their support of that. And I'm sure you will see an invitation to the LLC grand opening soon. Seventh and eighth grade open house will be Thursday the 18th at 6 o'clock. And Pond Cove's open house for grades K through 4 is Tuesday, September 30th from 6.30 to 7.30. And because it's the beginning of the year, we also have picture days coming up. I don't know when the high school's picture day is, Mr. Shed. It's already done. We get them when they're at their best. So the first day of school completed at the high school. The middle school will be this Friday. So we wait a little longer for those students. And then Pond Cove will be next Friday, the 19th. So I know that's an important piece. We try to get their pictures in at the elementary school before recess so that they are <laughs> as put together as possible for those family photos. I know my child will be coming home with one less tooth in her photo this year, which she's very excited about. And I have many things on this list, so bear with me. I do want to acknowledge the um, Panko Parents Association for their support of rebuilding Natureland. If you haven't seen the revitalized Natureland, it looks wonderful. Um, it's a great revitalized space for students. And um, related to that, I want to thank the Public Works Department for getting all of our playgrounds and playing fields ready and in order. And um, I think they look better than they may have ever looked, um, frankly. And I'm not just saying that. <laughs> I think they, they're well watered. I think our summer helped. It was good summer weather, and I think that has helped. Um, summer book group meetings were held. Uh, the, I participated in a group with students from the middle school this year, but students read The Aviary by Kathleen O'Dell, but that group met last Friday. 
students were very excited to come and talk about their books, whether they liked them or not. I don't know when the high school book group meetings are. Yours was Thursday, okay. So again, I think just a great opportunity for students and staff to come together to talk about books that they've chosen as topics of interest and share some common experiences under, the, under that theme of just building relationships and getting to know each other as human beings. Um, plus, you get to read something great. Jeff, what was your book? <laughs> Sorry. Between Shades of Grey by... It's Thank you. Not to be confused with a book of a similar title. Wow, this is yeah, Between, wow. Between <laughs> Shades of Grey. There's another reading. <laughs> That's right. Um, it's about a Lithuanian concentration camp in World War II. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, good. Sierra, thank you for saving <laughs> Festival Shed there. Wow. <laughs> you we have a really progressive There's some school. close calls here. It's, it's tricky. Um, Preschool is underway at Community Services, and um, the state, under its support of trying to build preschool initiative, um, is offering a training in early October that um, Russell Packett will be attending from Community Services, uh, Gay Sampson, one of our two pre-K teachers, one of our kindergarten teachers from Pond Cove, um, I will be attending, and they've limited the training groups right now to four people, though they've said they'll take Potentially, if, there's, if the training's not full, they may take additional people, and Kelly will join us. Um, Kelly Hassan from Pronko will join us if, if they'll allow us to bring extra people, but we're excited about the opportunity to begin working on building our pre-K program so that we can obtain state accreditation prior to the start of the next school year. That's cool. And so I will say it is an approved early childhood program under the Department of Health and Human Services right now. It's an existing child care program that has that approval. What we are looking for is Department of Education approval as a preschool program that would potentially qualify for pre-K funding from um, the state if the state moves any funding forward for pre-K, which I cannot guarantee. I was also able to attend the Middle School Parent Association meeting this morning and they are already hard at work on a variety of fundraisers to support school programs and offerings and I heard grants awarded already on their this first week of first full week of school. The High School Parents Association is meeting tomorrow morning so I will be visiting there for a bit as well and next Wednesday is the Pond Cove Parents Association meeting and um, they have also invited me to attend so again great opportunity just to hear all the work that they're doing but um, answer questions that folks may have about the work going on in the district. And I think I will stop there because I need a breather. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any questions? No. Okay. Item five, new business. May I have a motion? Um, sure. I move that we approve the athletic and co-curricular staff nominations. Um, that are outlined, there's lengthy names um, <clears throat> uh, throughout three pages of names actually. So it's as a slate, there are co-curricular and staff nominations for the district, for the middle school, for the high school, as well as Ponco Elementary School, with the exception of striking from Ponco, Fran Vita Taylor, and adding to the middle school, um, Joanne Bearer as the girls field hockey coach. So to make my motion clear, I approve that I'm, I'm, I move that we approve that those following athletic and co-curricular staff nominations as I've amended. Is there a second? Thank you, Michael. Uh, is there any discussion? <laughs> All those in favor? Yeah. I just point out for, for the TV audience, we did extensively in a executive session go over all of these names and, and had questions and uh, I wouldn't call them issues, but we raised questions about who, who was doing what, what why, why were they paying, being paid X. Um, so just look up and know this isn't something we just randomly approved, we put a lot, put some effort into it uh, in an executive session earlier this evening. Thank you, David. Uh, item 5B, 
I have a motion. Um, I move we approve the nomination for new personnel 2014-2015 um, high school physics teacher by the name of Jennifer LaFrance. Jennifer LaFrance. Um, for a 0.5 um, full-time equivalent. Is there a second? Motion? Thank you. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? 6-0. Oh, I guess we should have added that it's uh, 0.47 plus the 0 0.03 for advisory capacity to make it a 0.50. Okay. Thank you, Joe. Sorry. That's all right. Uh, item six, are there any committee chairs with reports to make? Shall I give uh, the board a brief update? Um, as you remember, uh, in November of last year, we uh, formally requested the town council to approve uh, the bond offering, uh, the school board bond offering or bond request. Um, that was a process, a culmination of over uh, 18 months of work and I'm sure we all remember the the many meetings and feedback we had and we also uh, did a presentation uh, to the town council in uh, January I think it was 29th earlier this year or uh, all uh, in January uh, reviewing the bond request and uh, what the next step is on visibility is uh, the school board chair, myself, and the superintendent are going to meet with the chair and finance chair and town manager next week to uh, finalize uh, the bond approval process. Um, you know, obviously, it's under the town council's authority to uh, decide what the process will be. Um, so I don't want to get too far uh, ahead of ourselves, but uh, I am confident that the town council will make a decision and what I would say would be a timely fashion, um, which would be in 2000 uh, this year, and that would give sufficient time to um, plan uh, all of these projects. Um, so once we get the, uh, after our meeting, um, I'll communicate with everyone um, what the exact timetable will be. So I'd like to thank uh, Jim Walsh and Jessica Sullivan, who've been helpful in this process, and we look forward to providing uh, the visibility the, the community and all the stakeholders are, are looking for. Thank you, Michael. Is, is it still, when you, after the meeting, we'll know not only the timetable, but the methodology for approval, town council versus public? Uh, that, that's our hope, Dave. Okay, thank you. Are there any other reports? Sure, um, I'll report out our progress on, um, in the policy committee, um, we, have decided to put forth for um, uh, for first and second readings as a as a group all of the co-curricular and extracurricular um, policies that have anything to do with substance abuse and referral to law enforcement and student codes of conduct because really they're so interrelated to not move them forward for public readings without them being together. Um, would be a disservice and just sort of be hard to wrap your head around how they all fit together. So um, we have some that are ready for a second reading, including the use of tobacco products, uh, system-wide student code of conduct, student alcohol, drug and health, tobacco use, and suspension of students. Um, we are holding those back so that we can put forward for the first readings, hopefully in October, for the co-curricular and extracurricular activities, eligibility and code of conduct, as well as the relations with law enforcement. And those two policies are going to be hashed out um, in our next policy meeting, which I'll jump ahead and tell you when those meetings are so you can be fully informed. So um, we have a policy meeting coming up on Wednesday September 17th at 4 o'clock to talk about JJJ and KLG and KLGR um, co-curricular and extracurricular eligibility code of conducts as well as referral to law enforcement in the hopes that we can get those ready for first reads in September I mean sorry October and then have them all ready for second reads in November so we can get those adopted and ready to go and in place so that we can start implementing those new policies come January. 
And I just want to say that the committee has been working really hard to make sure that those policies, which tend to be the most referred to, most talked about, most controversial, are reflecting what we now know about how students um, develop in developmentally appropriate, um, getting in some um, uh, consequences that are, are sort of a more rehabilitative consequences as a first blow, and so they're more progressive than the, the policies that we have. And this drastic change has taken an enormous amount of time and effort, and I know I say that every business meeting, but the work of the committee has been, I think, has, needs to be applauded for their really progressive take on these policies and ensuring that we're meeting students again in all of our aspects of where they're at and what they need and how we as a school system can use these policies to help encourage learning and growth. Um, so we really hope that when I give this speech again next month, when it's the first read for some of those policies, that we can all really engage the community and take a look and, and get some feedback. Does anyone else from the committee want to add to that? Because I know that you guys have been doing, David? has been doing an enormous I'm amount. Not a, I'm not a member of the committee, so I... No, but you have been a, a, an ad hoc member who's given I'm, some great feedback. I'm quite squawky ad hoc member, too, but it, it's been a good process, and I, I will add that um, there's a lot of differing views, but I, I, I'm, I'm very pleased with what we've done today, personally, and I think we all should be pleased that it is some fairly significant changes, as, as you said, Joe, that we're going towards what more modern neuroscience and neuroplasticity say about children and their developmental levels. And it's much more of trying to rehabilitate and restore as opposed to simply punish. I mean, we'll punish when we have to, but the first choice will be a process of getting kids to learn correct behavior versus wrong versus incorrect behavior. And that I think is fairly innovative in this state, and I think everybody should be very proud of, if this all gets passed, of what we're, we're attempting to do. Thank you, David. Thank you, Joe. Uh, there are there any other committee reports? No, thank you. <laughs> Transportation Appeals Committee met last week. Thank you. Um, the Evaluation Committee will be meeting September 30th at this point. We, negotiations team for administration will be setting dates sometime in the near future. Buildings and grounds will be meeting later this month. And um, at some point we need to set a, I'm waiting on a date from um, the town manager for an audit report meeting. Um, typically the town council has a workshop to hear the audit report and the school board is invited to attend that. Sometimes the, the board has the option to have its own um, meeting with the auditors. In the past, we've combined that. So that's something that we'll need to talk about moving forward. And um, one other request I have for the board, which isn't really in a, well, maybe an agenda request for a future meeting, but um, I shared at opening meeting, which some of you heard, and in um, newsletters to staff that we're forming a district innovation team um, to consider sort of a, a sort of a place to pr propose ideas and share um, creative thinking about how to move forward with the district and we'll be looking for hopefully a school board liaison to the liaison to that as well as student um, representatives to that committee so put that out there and I do want to also just briefly mention I have a meeting tomorrow with some folks at the middle school about a makerspace and if you're familiar with the makerspace <coughs> movement essentially makerspaces are studio type places where um, you can work on any number of things, be that sort of engineering or arts or um, robotics, um, but a place to sort of come together and um, explore with different materials. So there's a group of folks at the middle school who will be joining me um, for that conversation tomorrow afternoon. It's great. Uh, it is great. Thank you. So that this always happens. We get into meeting requests and committee reports in the same uh, item here. Are there any other uh, meeting, uh, upcoming meetings to be announced? Yes. 
Okay. So I want to correct what I said at our previous meeting about our upcoming Community Services Advisory Committee meeting. Um, I misspoke or was misinformed. I won't tell you which one, but uh, I originally said it was Thursday the 18th at 6.30 at Community Services, but actually it is Wednesday the 17th at Community Services at 6.30. And um, of most importance is the development and review of an upcoming survey that Community Services Advisory Committee is to be putting out to the community, hopefully to launch, uh, um, to get the most response on election day about what the needs in our community are and whether or not the existing services that Community Services is offering are meeting those needs. So it's kind of exciting work that's being done there. Thank you, Joe. Um, any other announcements of upcoming meetings? Okay. Circling back to item seven, are there any um, requests for school board agenda items? No. Okay. Then item nine, may I have a motion? I move that we adjourn. <coughs> All those in favor? Seven, okay. six. Thank you.